Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another Roll20 review, my written main video review series where I take a look at the Marketplace section, online role-playing website Roll20.net. This video I'll be reviewing Ghosts of Saltmarsh, designed by Wizards of the Coast, and adapted for Roll20. A review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my videos, consider supporting me via Patreon.com slash RogueWatson. Shout out to my Platinum Patrons, Andrew, Brian, Richard, Joe, Will, Tiny Dancer, and Charles. And gold Patrons, RPG Papercrafts, Charming Grenade, Pretty Boy and Yuma, Marco Stewart, Vicente, Gilberto, Sean, a.k.a. cert to be Adam, Dead Lizard Lounge, Alkshi, and Sam. Thank you all very much for your support. So Ghosts of Saltmarsh is uh, similar to Tales of the Yawning Portal, where it was a bunch of uh, classic Dungeons & Dragons modules from before I was ever interested in D&D, &D, uh, that have now been uh, modernized, adapted, and converted into 5th edition with a very obvious nautical pirate kind of theme. And uh, seven of these adventures have been bundled into just one big kind of campaign-style book. And then a loose story has been crafted to bring all of these... Uh, adventures together, which from what I understand, and again, I'm not familiar with the original, uh, several of them were already part of a series. So it kind of fits together as a story probably better than uh, Tales of the Yawning Portal ever did. Um, there is one caveat with Ghosts of Saltmarsh uh, with my review, and that is that uh, with the advanced review copy, I was only given access to one of the seven adventures to actually look at. Now, you could argue, you know, in terms of how Roll20 does its adaptations and whatever, I don't necessarily have to look at the whole thing. But one of the things I do like to do with my reviews is uh, go over the battle maps and explain how things look, how the maps look, because for Roll20's sake, specifically, I'm looking at how well these adventures translate into the virtual tabletop format, and then how things are organized, and if there's any additional uh, things that Roll20 has provided. So, I can't do a uh, as thorough of a job as I would normally do because I only have access to so uh, little of the content. And uh, I got a similarly truncated version with uh, Waterdeep Dragon Heist, but that one was a little different because that one had four different uh, seasons or villains, uh, basically different plot threads you could follow for Act 3, and I was given access to two of the four. And that one was a little better because... In theory, as a DM, you would pick one and then just run that adventure. Whereas here, the idea is you would hopefully run as many of the adventures as you could. But again, I'm only being able to look at one of them. And oddly enough, it's not even the first one. It's actually the last one. It's the 11th level uh, mission. Uh, the Styes is the one that I was given access to. So for whatever reason, that's what I'm looking at. So uh, it's going to be a little bit more of a limited review than what uh, you might normally see from me which is a bummer, but I can tell you that Ghosts of Saltmarsh, I like the written content a lot. I think there's a a lot of... The entire Appendix A, which is all of the new uh, like ship rules and for ship combat and underwater travel, and there are multiple battle map locations given with multiple story hooks in each one. All of that is really, really good to where if you were wanting to run any kind of nautical adventure campaign or any kind of campaign that had just players on a ship going through having adventures which I think is always a cool idea uh, there's a lot of really good reason to explore that in Ghosts of Saltmarsh granted if you're not going to run any of the adventures that's obviously probably a poor sale and unfortunately it doesn't look like you can actually purchase the adventures individually on Roll20 like you can with Tales of the Yawning Portal. It looks like it is all only in the $49.99 bundle that you get all of these adventures together. Um, the other bummer is the maps are very bare. There's some detail on there, but they are black and white. There's no color, uh, and they have kind of this tone that makes it look like this parchment, but like with uh, kind of a watery look to it, which I don't mind that part. But uh, in terms of a, a nice you know, virtual battle map that you can play on, they're definitely not what I would prefer to see. So that also is a step down from Tales of the Yawning Portal, which is a big bummer because obviously a good map can make or break, uh, you know, my opinion of a Roll20 module. So I like a lot of the written content here, and they do some fun things with uh, ships and ship tokens and all that, but it's a real bummer that the maps 
don't quite live up to what my expectations are. Um, normally, I would start off by telling you what all is included in the uh, bundle of Ghosts of Salt Marsh on Roll20, but unfortunately, as I mentioned, I don't have access to all the individual add-on modules, so I'm not actually sure what all maps are included in terms of the actual numbers, as well as uh, you know, normally I would break down you know, how many of them are 5-foot grid maps versus 10-foot grid maps, because that makes a big deal when you're putting together a campaign for a D&D 5th edition. It's a big pain to, to even try to do 10 maps, because you have to either you know shrink the tokens down to size, or blow the map up, or do something to make it work, because you have to have 5-foot grids, or D&D just kind of falls apart. So unfortunately, I can't really comment one way or the other on what the map situation is other than show you the ones that I have access to. Uh, you do get the uh, compendium with all of the content added in Ghosts of Salt Marsh. You also get an art pack that has any, basically any new token art that was included uh, for here. So probably a lot of like the named uh, NPC tokens uh, would be included here like this kind of token art. So you would get that in terms of, uh, you'd be able to add that to any of your other existing Roll20 uh, campaigns. They include two random battle maps here, which is funny because we do need sea battle maps because that's something that happens in uh, in the coast of Salt Marsh, and it's just literally the same parchment, but blank water, although it's a nice looking water map. <laughs> uh, you get the alphabetized token page, which is become very standard with the uh, Roll20 modules. In addition to being able to just drag anything off of the sheet, which is a huge, huge plus. Again, if you haven't purchased any kind of module or campaign or adventure on Roll20, one of the biggest, coolest things that you get is all of these tokens and character sheets already set up, ready to go, and you can either copy and paste them as you need them from this page. Everything is set up correctly. You know, control C and then move over to your page and control V. Or you can simply grab something off of here and drag it and then it appears right there and it's got hit points, it's got armor class, everything is tied to the character sheet. It's all done perfectly fine. That's good. Uh, I need to make sure to mention that just in case this is your first Roll20 module and you're not aware that that's how things work. Uh, it's not something that I'm going to continually like put as a pro, but because it's expected really it's expected now that the purchasing a roll 20 module i mean you're putting down 50 bucks uh you want all these character sheets and tokens ready to go and it is a huge huge time saver for here now because these are individual adventures this kind of thing is maybe less critical to have because there's a good chance you won't be seeing a whole lot of these monsters if you know if you're really if you're doing it all a cart style and just kind of picking and choosing which adventures you want to run but there are a lot here i believe there's over 250 uh, NPC monster and character sheets included here and I would probably wager 90% of them have token art which is really good because when they don't have token art it looks really really bad uh, let's give an example None of them. there we go and uh, this comes down to the fact that whenever you have a unique monster that did not have art from the book and is not in the standard rules document or anything like that uh, then Roll20 can't really do anything about that. They're just kind of hamstrung by not having art for it, so they just kind of create this uh, placeholder art. Now, I would argue that in some cases, you know, if there's uh, a creature that happens to be a named version of another creature, I would rather Roll20 just create, uh, use that same stock art, maybe tint it differently or something, you know, to make it different, but use that art. But there's some cases where there's just a completely different stat block that they just can't really do anything with and that's just kind of a bummer it's what we have to live with but a lot of it comes down to uh you know how well did wizards create uh monsters and did they create a whole lot of you know specific monsters for uh this adventure and this one appears to be one of the better ones i've seen in terms of it's got mostly just standard monsters from the monster manual and then the few ones that the new ones they seem to add uh all seem to have their own token art which is really really nice to see so alphabetized token page very nice the one cool full color detail map we get is a really good one. It is the hub town of Salt Marsh, uh, which from what I understand is kind of the base of operations if you're playing through the actual campaign of this adventure, which you totally don't have to. You can just add on as a, you can buy this and just play it as, you know, add uh, modules to your existing campaign or whatever. Uh, this is a really, really nice looking map. This reminds me of like the Fandolin map from Lost Mine of Fandover or Port Nianzaro or any of those. I don't know if it's actually a Mike Schley map or not, but it sure as hell looks like it in terms of the actual art style and the detail. This is what I mean, by the way, when I, when I say I like my maps. This is, this is the kind of map design I like. Give me these nice detail color maps. They look so good. 
Uh, this is the kind of thing where I would literally put like a token on the board to represent the players and have them go, you know, house to house to different areas just because I like this map and I want to show my players this map and it's really, really nice looking. Unfortunately, this is the only map of the bunch. From what I can see, there may be other maps for some reason that are that are this detailed, but I doubt it based on all the other maps that are included from what I have. But from what I can tell, this is the only nicely done full color uh, detailed map in the bunch. Uh, you do get the extensive appendix that's got detailed notes on ship rules, uh, ship combat, underwater combat. Uh, there's extra supplemental rules from the from the Dungeon Master's Guide that comes in handy. There's magic items. There's a lot of good content here. That appendix alone, I really need to minimize this uh, creatures. There we go. Uh, this appendix right here is absolutely amazing. It comes with information on all of the ships, which there are like half a dozen to choose from as well as actually has character sheets for the ships, which is very cool. So you can actually have uh, characters or you know enemies firing the ballista or the mangonol, which is apparently a, a mounted uh, catapult. Uh, really cool. There's a lot of good information in here, more than I ever expected to have. Uh, you can see they're actually annotated because there are uh, battle maps for the ships that you can use, as well as tokens for ships, which is a really cool thing that I'll show you in just a second. Actually, I think we're about there, because I think that was pretty much everything I wanted to cover that was included. So, also, the modules are included as add-ons, which means when you purchase Ghosts of Saltmarsh in Roll20, you have to add them, add each add-on that you want, uh, which are each of the seven uh, adventures, you have to add them individually to your campaign. And I think this is the right way to do it, because it's not a big deal to add them. It takes, like, you know, two seconds to go there and just add these, you know, it's a drop down menu when you click on your uh, campaign. But if you specifically know you you did not want to play with some of the adventures, you either wanted to skip them or, you know, again, you do a la carte, you can just pick and choose whichever ones you want, then you just do not have to add them to your campaign and then all of that content won't show up in the middle of your journal so you don't have to go through and manually delete it, for example. So I think that's the better way to go about it because then it gives you the option to kind of pick and choose what you want. Unfortunately, there's no way to if you do add them all and then decide later you don't want one, I don't believe you can just simply remove an add-on. Uh, I think you have to go through and manually actually delete all the content that you don't want. But uh, most people would probably just want to have them all in there, which is fine. But I think it's nice to have those as separate add-ons. The bummer is I wish you could just simply purchase these all separately like you could with uh, Yawning Portal. I don't know why they force you uh, into the bundle here. One of the coolest things that the Roll20 version does is the new ship token. So normally, actually, let's look at the uh, battle maps first. So ship travel is a big part of Ghosts of Salt Marsh. You'll be on your ships traveling to different locations. So there's a whole bunch of uh, opportunities for uh, ocean encounters in the middle of your adventures and all that. And you'll be on ships for these. So you've got these uh, battle maps here. And this is where you see the numbers and the annotations that I mentioned. Uh, let's see, right here, as so you can see, main deck, all that stuff. Uh, they've already got a few tokens on there. And it's broken up by uh, decks, so each of these ships has, you know, technically a level on it. Now, I actually found these ship battle maps to be a little problematic because they are so tiny uh, that it's literally only good enough if you just want to have, for some reason, have the players on a battle map that's just the ship and nothing else. Now, this works if, you know, maybe there's a storm or for some reason you just want to do a dialogue scene of just showing them this ship rather than a map. Or, uh, I, I don't know, there was a... I'm, tr I'm trying to think of a, a combat encounter that would result in only needing the ship itself and not any of the surrounding space, and I'm, I'm even trying to... I'm failing at coming up with that. I don't know why this wasn't put on a much larger map, so you could then uh, put it with other... You know, there was a... The Dungeon Master's Guide has a, has a, has a ship map that's, that's got the two uh, different levels of the sailing ship. I believe it's the same one. And it's got a way bigger space on it, so that way, you, if you wanted to, you could put a bunch of Sawagan or, you know, whatever enemies, or even put another ship on that map, so you can have battles on your ship map, but this right here is too small to do a battle on, and unfortunately all the uh, ship maps seem to be like that. This one, this one's a little bigger, but that's because it's got two of them on there. Uh, but I would have liked this. I would have liked for this battle map to be superimposed onto this. You know, give me give me that same ship map, but give me a much larger area so that I can pick and choose and play with, you know, whatever encounters I want to have. Now the solution to that, which Roll Twenty has provided, although given what it, what, what they did with the battle maps, they almost kind of 
softly force you into doing this. But it's an interesting idea and one that I hadn't considered is it turns the maps instead of uh, the ships, instead of turning them into maps, they are tokens. And the reason that's interesting is because these are multi-sided tokens that you can actually flip between levels. This is something that I'd never consider. I've been using Roll20 for a long time, and I would never consider using a ship as a token. And I think it's really, really cool. Because what this means is you can choose the side. So if you look at the bottom here with the, uh, this is, I guess, the bottom level with the crates and everything, and you can then just pop it up here, and then it instantly morphs to the next level of the ship. It's a really, really cool system. So you can keep tokens on one level, and then as players move, you can then transition. The only weird one is the very top one, uh, the kind of raised platforms. For some reason, instead of doing like a grayed out box here, it's just literally like floating sides of the ship. Now, there are a couple problems with this. First of all, it's on the token layer, which means it's competing with other tokens. So uh, if you've got a, uh, let's see, you've got an ape on the ship. Um, and somehow you just don't want to, you know, select one thing and have the other. But you can see it as you transition, everything should remain on the same layer. But if for some reason you had a token on there originally and then you brought the ship over, then this would be, you know, on the back. And then you try to bring this over and it hides behind the token. And you might have an opportunity where, you know, tokens are going to be overlapping. You might accidentally grab the ship and start moving it around. So that creates some problems, which hopefully would be acceptable enough to work with. The other problem I foresaw is if people, obviously one person goes down the level of the ship and everybody else stays up top, how the hell do you do that? That still creates the same problem. Now, obviously, if you wanted to do that, in fact, let's just do an example. Let's copy, because this is a big deal of this module. You're going to be working with these ships. So you can copy and paste this ship here, which again, this is using this map, which is nice. Uh, you can flip it around. Although, for some reason, the <laughs> the actual uh, HP bar doesn't flip along with it. I guess that's good, because you don't want that upside down and shit. Um, but you can copy that here, and then if you wanted to, paste the other one, and then essentially create what you just did, although that kind of defeats the purpose. But the point is, this allows you to use multiple levels of the ship and use this uh, bigger battle map. So now this is something I can actually work with in terms of you know having... Uh, sea battles on there and it lets you move the ship around on the map so you can create more dynamic environments even have the ship moving so although it's a bummer that the ship battle maps are, i think are too small i think the solution they created almost eliminates that problem because i would instantly rather just use these tokens now the big bummer is these tokens are like the maps they're not colored they do have detail on there. It just oh, the color alone would have made so much of a big difference, and it's a big shame these are black and white because especially against the color backdrop of this, it looks and against you know all the colorful tokens that you're gonna have on there, it's really gonna stand out that this thing is just black and white. So it's a big, big, big bummer. This is not colored, but I think it's a really, really cool uh, solution to do. And obviously, you can turn them. I mean, you could do some really cool stuff with this, uh, and it ends up being really neat. Uh, the other, and it's not just this one. I'm using the sailing ship as an example but uh, this one in fact this one does a good job of having you can see the lower end of it uh, has grayed out instead of having these floating like sides this one might be the the best one of the bunch and it only has two levels it's got uh, the top and the bottom this is like the classic like everybody sits down uh, rowing um, but I, I think they're really cool it's a, it's a really cool idea I think it works really well it's a good solution to that problem of how do you work with these uh, ship battle maps and I think it's I think it's really cool um, the only other things I can go over for this review are the one adventure that I was given as well as the random underwater location. So the adventure is the styes. This is the level 11. This is the, you know, seven of seven adventures. This is a very much kind of Lovecraftian inspired, uh, you know, classic seaside horror. And they, they do a cool thing where they kind of combine like a Jack the Ripper murder mystery which is really neat that, you know, at 11th level, you're really entering, like, the Tier 3 of play. So you're getting up there to some challenging things. But this one really starts you off with a pretty uh, straightforward, almost mundane murder mystery as the players get to this, you know, very sad, decrepit uh, fishing village. And as you discover these murders, you actually get there. It kind of reminds me of that uh, Denzel Washington movie, uh, Fallen, where uh, the plot is the murderer has been uh, already executed, but the murders are still uh, taking place. 
So now you have to try to figure out is there a copycat murderer or what's going on. So the players get to kind of show up, and as player characters do, they are, they're the ones that have to get to the bottom of this and figure it out. And uh, it turns out, and by the way, obviously, spoilers here, these are DM-only reviews. <laughs> Uh, it turns out that an Aboleth has become obsessed with a god, uh, Tharizdun, this cult, and apparently that's a big no-no for Aboleths. They are they abhor gods because they consider themselves to be kind of the gods, basically the rightful rulers of everything. Uh, and it's become obsessed with this cult, and it found this uh, baby kraken in the depths of wherever Aboleths come from, and with like a scar and whatever, and it, it looked at that as like a sign. So it. Its life goal now is to nurture this baby kraken into uh, this new powerful being that's going to be the scion of this god. Kind of reminds me a lot of uh, what a Serac does in uh, Tomb of Annihilation in, in some ways, in terms of that plot. But um, and the cool thing is, in the third act, you know, the players have to figure out that who's causing these murders. Well, the Aboleth was controlling this person who was doing the murders, and now the Aboleth's uh, thralls are now just committing the murders to feed negative energy into this kraken to pump it up full of I don't know bad thoughts and then the kraken can grow even faster and quicker and more malevolently and then when the players uh, show up to fight the kraken in act three they're uh fight the aboleth uh, it is actually fled because two like cop aboleths <laughs> have like followed this other aboleth and said no you can't do this we have horror religion why are you like nursing a kraken this is messed up and so you have to fight that Aboleth first, and then you go back to the lair and find the two, like, cop Aboleths that have, uh, are now in the old Aboleth's lair, the juvenile Kraken's in there, and then the players can actually have this really crazy, like, dialogue sequence if they wanted to with these two Aboleths and try to convince the Aboleths to, like, either back off or kill the Kraken or try to enslave it or do something. There's a lot of really interesting, uh, things that the players can do, and it's, it, it seems like a really cool idea. It's a pretty, it's, it feels like a pretty short, module so I can't and again that's the only one I have access to so I can't speak to the overall adventure but unlike Tales of the Young Portal which was specifically dungeon crawling it was just a series of big classic dungeons updated for 5th edition this one is really more about adventures uh, you know kind of serialized pulp adventures uh, and from I, and I like the adventure in this one I think it's a cool idea it's got a cool uh, hook with the murder mystery starting out but the actual dungeon part of it is very, very minor. Like, the dungeons themselves, there's one warehouse here, uh, and you're just kind of following the clues. Uh, the actual temple, which is where you go to fight the uh, the original Aboleth who started this whole thing, and then the Aboleth's original lair. And all of these, you can see, are actually kind of small. Like, there's not very many rooms or anything of that nature. So, in terms of a dungeon crawl, it definitely does not scratch that itch. But in terms of just a kind of small mini adventure with a neatly contained story, you know, it's just one village having problems. You have to get to the bottom of this mystery, and you discover the the Aboleth infestation and all these things. Uh, I think that is actually pretty effective. Now, unfortunately, as you can see here, I'm torn because these maps they're at least better than the Waterdeep Dragon Heist maps. Which, if you watched my Roll Twenty review on Dragon Heist. I did not like those Dyson Logos maps at all. I do not like that style. I have no nostalgia for that kind of black and white graph paper etching style whatsoever. Uh, I'm not a fan. This is not that, but it's just a shame that it's still in that black and white. I like the the kind of background. I don't know if this is Roll20 doing this or if this is the original published adventure, but I like the kind of background of the watery look to it so it's not purely on you know white paper. I think that looks really, really good. I just wish there was just a little bit more color used in these because it would have helped things stand out so well instead of just being this kind of black and white uh, art style. But you can see here the dynamic lighting is in place. All these crates have dynamic lighting as well as the boxes. That's all already there. And again, this is standard stuff. If you haven't, if you're not familiar with the Roll20 official modules, this is the kind of stuff that you get and stuff that makes any time if you're going to run this adventure on Roll20, I would nine times out of ten recommend getting the Roll20 module, you know, make your players chip in for it, um, because it's a huge time saver, the tokens and sheets alone, but then also the maps uh, have all the dynamic lighting, everything in place. That being said, this one, the maps are just not very impressive from a purely design standpoint, it's just, there's not, there's not a whole lot of dungeon here. On the flip side, uh, the Ghost of Salt March includes... Uh, three locations that you can use. 
So we can find that section in the journal here. Uh, underwater locations can be used for single session adventures or as side tracks to help you fill out the story of Salt Marsh. And they're given three of these, the Cove Reef, Wreck of the Marshall, and the Warthakeel Ruins. And these are really cool maps, unfortunately the same style that I'm not a big fan of, although better than you know other map styles that I have seen. Uh, these are gigantic maps. Um, actually, I think only one of them might be a 10-foot scale. I think the rest might be 5-foot scales. Uh, but very, very big maps designed mostly to be like underwater. Uh, well, I mean, they are underwater locations. These are these are the kind of underwater dungeons I was picturing. And, you know, these aren't literally like underwater temples, but they're just vast sections of underwater land that kind of act as a dungeon because of all these different, uh, you know, hazards and things in here. There's a giant sea anemone here that can hurt people. Uh, there's a giant you know, gorge in the abyss here. And what's cool is there are different things that you can do. So, for example, for the Cove Reef, there are actually different story hooks, which are kind of mini, I guess adventure is too strong of a word, but uh, mini events that can take place here. And they're actually scaled depending on level, too. So you can either, like, uh, focus on the uh, Kuatua in the area, recommended for fifth level. The Coven of Wet Rot involves uh, a, uh, uh, what's the word, Coven of Sea Hags, who have captured a bronze dragon and are trying to, like, you know, do evil things to it. So it's, it's a neat way to use this area no matter where your players are or what their needs are or what your needs are as the DM. And this is true of all three of these areas. So that's a really, really cool addition uh, because I think you'll get a lot of use out of this no matter which of the adventures you actually run. These would be really fun to just kind of insert in terms of, as I said, sidetracks or as... Uh, just in between locations, in between adventures, going from one location to another, you can then do one of these events. And I think they're all pretty cool. They do a good job of showing off various uh, underwater, you know, you've got sunken ships, uh, all, you know, all the very obvious monsters involved, uh, Sawagan and uh, Sahawagan. How do you pronounce that? I think I've heard everybody do a different version of that. Oops, I just went to that, that same one. Uh, there's giant moray eels. I said uh, the sea hags, uh, octopus. Just a lot of really cool monsters used here, and I think I, I like I like these maps a lot. I just wish they were a little bit better uh, in terms of having just a little bit of color. I think would have made a huge. There's an actual crack in here. Uh, it just would have made a huge, huge difference, and really would have elevated this whole thing and made it better for Roll Twenty. So I think it's a big bummer that Wizards continues to lean on this bare bones art style i understand folks there are a lot of folks who enjoy it who like this art style who are nostalgic about it who don't mind the bare maps but for people who primarily play on roll 20 as i do i would vastly prefer to have nice battle maps you know with full color and details and all that so that part is a bummer but i like the content that's included here there's a lot of really, really great content if you're doing any kind of nautical-themed uh, adventure. If you're not actually running any of the adventures included here, then obviously I don't think it's going to be worth just purchasing this for you know these few underwater locations. But at least if some of those locations interest you, uh, and again, unfortunately, I can't go over all of them because I don't have access to all of them. I only have access for that last one. But I thought that last one, the styes, was really cool. That is something that I would definitely want to run because I think it's a really cool adventure. It's got fun themes of, you know, kind of eldritch hordes, a cool use of aboleths, uh, multiple aboleths. Can you imagine fighting three aboleths in one kind of mini-adventure? You don't even have to end up fighting all three of them. Uh, so that's a neat idea, and if the other adventures are like that, I'm just having to extrapolate based on the one, then I could definitely recommend this campaign uh, playing through the whole thing. Even if not... Playing through a la carte, probably at least half of them would make this module worth it because you've got a lot of extra content here in terms of all these underwater locations. All right, let's go over my pros and cons. Oh, one more thing I want to go over. Uh, the macros that are included here, uh, which is actually one of the really cool things that Roll20 does. Um, rollable tables and macros. So... You've got just an endless supply right here, which this is the kind of bummer is it just makes a bit of a mess because all the rollable uh, tokens and everything else, like if you have a, for example, a were rat, uh, wear rat, then you can select that token and, and uh, similar to what I just showed on the ship, you can change that token. In fact, I can just show you. 
Um, let's see, what is a, let's go down to the where section because I don't know what all can transform. Uh, anything that can transform its actual form. Let's see, do we have an example? Those are named. I need W's, where, there we go. All right, so our friend the where bear. Uh, you can right click this. It's got multi sided. You go to choose side, and then you can shift the token over. Uh, in this case, multiple tokens. These are probably because they're unique NPCs that might actually use this uh, token art. I think if you shift click, it just shows the standard one, yeah. Um, can I Z that sucker? Maybe not. Um, but this is a really cool benefit of anything that can shapeshift tokens. You can just sh uh, shift that token over just to visually show that it's transformed, which is really neat. Um, all of those appear on this right side. But the macros uh, means you can roll, for example, uh, any kind of random encounter or treasure table. Or if you need to roll for, uh, let's just do this. So art object. And it instantly rolls that to you. Now you can see here the problem is when I clicked that, that just rolled it to everybody, uh, which you could do for something like treasure. That might be something you want to do. Is it's like, hey, I'm gonna roll something for you, and then they'll instantly see, you know, that you rolled something random, and maybe they want to do it. But if it's a random encounter and you don't want to obviously roll that too soon, uh, what Roll Twenty has done is provide you with all of the macros that you need to just copy and paste and then add that as a macro to yourself and what it does is it whispers it to the GM so only you see that and you can see I made one uh, for road travel right here you just click on test macro and this is what it does it actually and it does it does this one three different ones I, I copy and pasted all three of them if you wanted to you could make three separate macros I mean you can make this however you want but uh, this one it looks like it rolls it for ambushes, villages, and manors, and caravans, depending on what kind of event you need your players to do and what you're actually rolling for. And this is true for any of these things. So, um, boy, there's a lot here. Uh, let's say, let's see, where's the styes? Uh, if you wanted to roll the damage for the glyph of warding, so you would cop, ooh, you would copy this over, not everything, just that, and copy. Uh, we go to macro. We go to add. We paste, we say uh, glyph of wording, we save changes, and then you can click on this and click test macro, and it already has everything plugged in, and this whispers it to the DM, even with a little text box here, and says, hey, they already rolled the lightning damage, everybody that triggered this rune as they got down to the boss room just took 20 lightning damage. Fun fact, if you trigger a glyph, to, a glyph of warding while underwater, no saving throw because you do not want to get hit by lightning while underwater because that shit will singe the hell out of you. So that's a funny little rule there. Uh, but it's a really cool thing, and the fact that they included every single one of these macros here uh, to let you instantly copy and paste everything that you need into your own macro sheet. And you can see it just took me two seconds. Just Control-C, Control-V, name it whatever, click it, boom, you're there, is awesome that's really really cool so a big plus uh big thumbs up for me for doing that and letting it be really really user friendly and easy to use all right because that's gonna be on my pros and cons now <laughs> pros and cons for the ghosts of salt marsh um pros i like that adventures can be individually added as add-ons uh that lets you do like a piecemeal uh a la carte so in case you know ahead of time you for sure do not want to run some of the adventures just don't add them to the module and you don't have to see all that shit and have to manually deleted it afterwards uh pro rollable ship tokens are a brilliant solution for quickly shifting between levels of large ships as well as allowing you to use that random battle map and just position your ships around that is a really really cool concept that it that if it weren't for the me being kind of uh, on the maps this would be an incredible adaptation just because of those ships i think it's it's a really cool add and a really neat feature that I never even thought it's one of those that I never even realized that I wanted before now that I see that I'm like oh shit yeah I want I want ship tokens instead of instead of ship maps that works so much better um, oh I uh, pro the salt marsh region specific player backgrounds I didn't even go over that this is actually not really roll 20 doing this is uh, you know Wizards of the coast but it is a separate section which is nice uh, right here which I they kind of do this with some of the backgrounds i think in some of the recent adventures but this one they added new ones as well as made relevant ones for every single character background so they have all the standard ones from the player handbook acolyte uh criminal entertainer folk hero hermit all of those but they're all given specifically 
like okay you're a hermit but how why are you a hermit in the salt you know assuming you're playing the salt marsh campaign how are you this person in there if you're an acolyte okay then you must be a follower of procan uh because that's the uh major deity in this area or they added new ones such as shipwright and uh marine and fisher that would obviously be very applicable to a nautical adventure so i think it's a really cool ad uh all of these make it more interesting because one of the biggest Difficult things for a DM is when you're running a specific adventure and your players come up with some elaborate backstory and you as a DM think, okay, that's great, but how am I supposed to connect that to this adventure? Because you just said, okay, you grew up in some desert town and all your shit's in the desert, but we're having a nautical themed adventure, which by the way, have a session zero, you know, <laughs> talk to your players about what is, what would be applicable to the adventure and what wouldn't be. Uh, but this way you've got background set up and ready to go. So anybody from whatever background can then be applied to this campaign assuming you're making a new character for a ghost of salt marsh campaign uh pro every macro you could want for rollable tables and encounters as i just went over it uh, i think that's a really cool feature here and pro the appendix a section is amazing it adds notes on multiple kinds of ships ship combat random encounters as well as three large battle maps with uh, underground underwater battle maps with multiple story hooks this is all in one appendix, and it's all fantastic. This is exactly what I want to help fill out. That makes it more than just a, you know, a, a, a conversion of these old adventures to 5e. They created all of these extra rules for nautical travel and ocean encounters, as well as you know, ships and underwater, and then gave you those three underwater locations, which all have multiple different types of creatures and levels of things you can do, depending on when, as the DM, you want to use them. And they're very modular and very cool, and I like that a lot. Cons, except for the Salt Marsh Town map, all battle maps lack color. Uh, it's such a bummer because I really want to like this adventure a lot. Um, and it's just a bummer. These battle maps, the design, at least on the underwater locations, is good. Uh, I don't know, based on the, maybe uh, you all can tell me, based on the other adventures, if they would have more kinds of dungeon crawling available but maybe you don't necessarily need that because it's not really about dungeon crawling this is about you know nautical seafaring adventures so they don't necessarily have to have that but again if you're playing on roll 20 you're playing on a virtual tabletop even if you just have like a warehouse map or you know a single ship or something i want it to look good and i don't think these look very good um and con the adventures can only be pur purchased as part of the bundle i do wish you could purchase the individual adventures uh, together, like you could on Roll20 with Tales of the Yawning Portal, uh, because maybe you only want to run some of those adventures together, and maybe you've got other ideas for a wider campaign. You said, okay, well, we're going to use like these two adventures from this campaign as a you know sidetrack total. Well, here you have to buy the whole thing and, and get into it. So the question of whether or not it's worth it becomes, I think you really have to end up running at least like half of these adventures to make it worth it, because I don't think... I don't think 49.99 is worth just utilizing this underwater location and rules area, although it is very, very good, uh, without having like really nice full color battle maps or anything. You really have to want to run most of these adventures to actually make this uh, a worthy purchase. Final verdict: Ghosts of Salt Marsh provides a wealth of adventures, locations, and ship rules for nautical themed campaigns. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewatson.com. You can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewatson. And you can follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel. Thank you.